In this video, we are going to capture the fundamental idea concerning energy. To begin, we have to define energy. Defining energy is difficult. Even the Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard Feynman had a hard time defining energy. The best definition I found for energy is that energy is the state of matter that makes things change or has the potential to make things change. There are several different types of energy, including thermal energy, nuclear energy, radiant energy, but we're going to concern ourselves here with mechanical energy. And specifically, we are going to focus on two basic types of energy, and they are potential energy and kinetic energy. And when dealing with potential energy, there are two fundamental types of potential energy that we are going to be interested in. And those are going to be gravitational potential energy as well as strain potential energy. Let's start with gravitational potential energy. Gravitational potential energy is the energy associated with position. Let's take an object that's laying on the ground. Currently, it's not changing. Additionally, we can say that it has no capacity to change. Unless there was a force acting on it, something we'll talk about in the next lesson, the object would just sit on the ground indefinitely. Now, let's say we raise an object off, off of the ground. Now it's going to have a certain capacity to change. All we have to do is release it, and the object will move. It will change its position, and it will move back down towards the surface of the Earth. Consequently, if we raise an object up higher, it's going to have a greater capacity to change. And again, all we have to do is release it, and we'll see the object return back to Earth, and the higher it is off the ground, the more potential it has to make that change. So therefore, the height off the ground is going to be an important consideration when we talk about potential energy. In fact, potential energy is the energy associated with position. The higher something is off the ground, the greater capacity to change, and therefore the greater gravitational potential energy. The formula for gravitational potential energy is equal to the mass times the acceleration due to gravity times the height. Usually, but not always, we are going to say that height is how high off of the ground it is. There will be instances where we might state that our zero point will be different than wherever the level ground is, but for the most part we're going to use ground as our reference point. The next type of potential energy we have is going to be strain potential energy. Strain potential energy is the energy associated with deformation. That is best going to be described by using this tennis ball right here. The tennis ball is going to drop, and when it hits the ground, it's going to deform. Then when it reforms or reconstitutes back into its original shape, then it's going to leave the ground. We can say the same thing if we're talking about a rubber band. You stretch that rubber band, the rubber band deforms, and you store a certain amount of potential energy within the rubber band. That capacity to change is there, all you have to do is release it. Our next form of energy is kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is the energy associated with motion. And so far we've talked about two different types of motion. We've talked about linear motion as well as angular motion. And therefore we're going to have two different types of kinetic energy. We're going to have linear kinetic energy, and we're going to have angular kinetic energy. Let's talk about linear kinetic energy first. Kinetic energy is the energy associated with motion. If something is moving, it's changing. What is it changing? It's changing its position. And if it's changing its position, it has energy. We can also say that something that is moving faster is going to have more energy than something is moving more slowly because it is changing its position more rapidly. The formula for linear kinetic energy is going to be equal to one-half the mass times the velocity squared. This formula might look very similar to the formula we have for linear momentum. If you recall, linear momentum is equal to the mass times the velocity. Here, though, we only have one half of the mass times the velocity, and that velocity term is actually squared. So unlike momentum, 
where the mass and the velocity are equally weighted in determining the magnitude of the momentum. Here, for linear kinetic energy, that velocity term is squared, and therefore it's going to have a more profound effect in the mass in determining how much kinetic energy something has. So we see here, if a runner starts and she has a certain amount of velocity, she's going to have a certain amount of linear kinetic energy. If at another point in time she's going faster than what she was going before, she's going to have a greater amount of kinetic energy. Similarly, if she starts with a certain velocity, she's going to have a certain amount of kinetic energy. Then, if she starts to run more slowly, she's going to have a decrease in her amount of kinetic energy because she has a decrease in her velocity. Next, let's tackle angular kinetic energy. Angular kinetic energy is again going to be energy associated with motion, but in this case we're talking about energy associated with a rotation. So we can look at two different bats here, and the bats are rotating. The bat that's rotating more quickly is changing its orientation more rapidly, and therefore it's going to have a greater amount of angular kinetic energy. The formula for angular kinetic energy is going to be equal to 1 half i omega squared. And again, I hope you can appreciate the similarity between angular momentum and angular kinetic energy. The difference is we're going to have that one half term in front of the i omega, and secondly, that omega term is going to be squared. So once again, unlike angular momentum, where the i and the omega are equally weighted in determining the magnitude of the angular momentum, here, because that angular velocity term is squared, it's going to have a more profound effect on the magnitude of the angular kinetic energy. Again, we can say that if a bat is going to be rotating, it's going to have a certain amount of angular kinetic energy. If that bat now starts to rotate more rapidly, it is going to have an increase in its angular kinetic energy. Similarly, if we have a bat that's rotating, and then it ends up rotating more slowly, it's going to have a decrease in its amount of angular kinetic energy. So again, if we take a quick look at our types of mechanical energy, we say that we have both kinetic energy and we have potential energy. For our kinetic energy, we have both linear kinetic energy as well as angular kinetic energy. And for our potential energy, we have gravitational potential energy and strain potential energy. I should also probably pause here and say that energy is a scalar. So unlike momentum, which was a vector, our kinetic energy, and even our potential energy for that matter, are scalars. And therefore they are going to have magnitudes associated with them, but they are not going to have any particular spatial direction. I wish to close by talking about the conservation of energy. The conservation of energy tells us that energy cannot be created or destroyed. You can move energy from one place to another, you can change it from one form to another, but overall the total amount of energy never changes. Let's take a look at something that leaves the ground. And let's, for purposes of illustration, say that this object, let's call it a ball, is going to be going straight up into the air. When it leaves the ground, it's going to have a certain amount of linear kinetic energy. Let's call that amount of kinetic energy just some value E. At that point, its gravitational potential energy is going to be zero. Once the object gets up to its apex, we can see here that its velocity is going to be zero. If its velocity is zero, then its linear kinetic energy is going to be zero. At this point, though, it's raised a certain height off of the ground. That height that it's raised off of the ground is going to be the amount of potential energy. And because energy cannot be created or destroyed, we can only move energy from one place to another or change energy from one form to another, we see that the amount of gravitational potential energy at the apex is going to be equal to the linear kinetic energy at takeoff. And what we had was we had a transformation between kinetic energy and potential energy. Now, as the ball travels back down to Earth, we are gonna see that same process in reverse. The object will start with a certain amount of gravitational potential energy, which we set as some arbitrarily value E, and it'll start with a linear kinetic energy of zero. 
on its way back down, it's going to be picking up speed as it's losing its position. So here we have a transformation of gravitational potential energy into linear kinetic energy. And then when that ball hits the ground, it's going to hit the ground with the amount of linear kinetic energy of E, the same value with which it took off from, and zero gravitational potential energy since it's now back on the ground. Now I mentioned to you that energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can be only moved from one place to another or changed from one form to another, but the total amount of energy never changes. However, when we looked at both the runners as well as the bats, we saw that the bat could be increasing or decreasing its energy, as well as the runner could be increasing or decreasing its energy. So how do we have a change in energy if energy cannot be created or destroyed? That is going to be something that we will talk about in our next video. In this video, we talked about the fundamental idea of energy. Next up, we'll see how we can change energy by doing work.